got to ring the opening bell on Wall Street. Um, I was on all sorts of morning shows, um, you know, talking with Matt Lauer, Katie Couric, um, throwing a, out the first pitch at the Boston Red Sox game, which is for me, they're like, they're my favorite team in the world. Um, that was a huge honor. Um, and then my hometown had a huge parade for me, which was, you know, to be honest, it was so embarrassing. Um, and they, they even put uh, below the sign, you know, welcome to Marblehead. It was hometown of Tyler Hamilton. So, you know, um, about a month later, you know, you, so from the outside, you think like, oh, you know, things are good for this guy. You know, a month later, uh, something I probably had been battling my whole life, but I was, I was diagnosed with clinical depression. And it was like, so from the outside, basically, like, things look, you know, great, like, great. But obviously, like, things were starting to probably, um, you know, so, depression is something I think, I believe I fought my whole life. But, you know, you have episodes when it kind of comes out and... Uh, it was definitely eye-opening, you know. I, I had basically, I basic, after this amazing Tour de France for me, I had um, gone on to like sign a new two-year contract with a different team, uh, become a team leader of this uh, up-and-coming team called Phonak, a Swiss-based team. Um, basically had all the things in the world to be happy about, and yeah, but on the inside, and due to many different things, but I think a lot of the secrets, you know, it was, I was basically, it was eating me up from the inside out. Um, we'll fast forward to, yeah, 2004, uh, Olympic, basically I won Olympic gold medal. The Tour de France that year didn't go so well. I had a, you know, I had the bad blood bag and the tour, that was part of it. But an accident where I, uh, hurt my back really bad, took me out of the tour. Uh, so it was basically the first time in eight, eight, eight straight years that I had to, had to retire from the Tour de France. And that was a, a big blow to me. I, I hated giving up and I hated quitting. Uh, I've never been a quitter, but I thought it was better to maybe uh, drop out of the Tour de France and shift the gears and focus on something else. And uh, with the Olympic Games right around the corner, I thought, you know, man, if I could get a medal at the Olympic Games, that would be, for me, the Olympic Games were the highest, highest sporting event in the world, the biggest sporting event in the world. I'd been, you know, glued to the te television in 1980 uh, when I was, what, like nine years old during the Lake Placid Olympics and, you know, watching Mar the Americans win a gold medal and hearing the national anthem was, for me, the ultimate. And I thought, man, if that could ever be me, that would be just the pinnacle of, of it all. And sure enough, it happened. Athens, Greece, uh, I won an Olympic gold medal. And, um, but guess what? I got, got on that podium, heard the, you know, national anthem, and it didn't, it didn't feel like it was supposed to feel. Um, but rightly so, you know, I'd, I'd been cheating. Um, fast forward about a month, and there, since I didn't have a good Tour de France, the team asked me to, to ride in another Grand Tour, which was called the Tour of Spain, with the Vuelta. And uh, it was about halfway through, and uh, the worst thing imaginable, imaginable, hap imaginable, the worst thing imaginable could have happened to me, and all of a sudden, I find out that I had a positive test. And to me, at that time, you know, it was what I dreaded. I knew, I always knew what I was doing was there was a risk and, um, and I, was, I was scared, excuse my language, but I was scared shitless of testing positive and, and all of a sudden it happened. Um, and so yeah, my life went, you know, from the highest to highs, basically just straight down. And uh, it, was a, it was a crazy ride. I'll fast forward about, um, oh, sorry, before that, yeah, I guess at that point, maybe, okay, a positive test, like, maybe a good time to finally tell the truth. Um, but I, I, I didn't, I didn't for a couple or several different reasons. Um, number one was there was a code of silence in cycling at the top tier, and we called it the Omerta. You didn't talk about, you know, it was like a brotherhood, a fraternity. We didn't, you didn't talk about what happened behind closed doors. It just, you didn't do it. Um, so if I was going to tell the truth, I was going to have to basically only say, okay, I did it all on my own and um, that's it. Nobody was involved. Or I could continue to lie and uh, hope, that, hope that I'd get another chance at coming back two years later after my suspension. 
And I knew if I did tell the truth, I would be, you know, blackballed from the sport of cycling. Um, even if I didn't name any names. So yeah, um, and basically, I'll fast forward to the year 2010. So it's basically 10 years, or better part of 10 years or so after, eight, eight years or so after my Tour de France, last Tour de France. And, you know, my life at living with these secrets were absolutely killing me. For whatever reason, I, I, I thought I was doing the right thing by staying quiet about it, you know. Although I had no relationship with it, really any of my past teammates or past staff members, I felt like I owed it to everybody to keep my mouth shut and keep, you know, take these secrets to the grave. And I was ready, I was planning on doing it, I was doing it. But the problem was the secrets were like killing me from the inside out, you know, one day at a time. And it was, uh, life was not good, it was just, I kept thinking to myself like, okay, I'm gonna keep getting out of bed every day and putting one foot in front of the other and eventually life's gonna get better. You know, it was, it was, it was not fun, not fun. And then finally it was like, out of nowhere this angel came down and a, by the name of Jeff Nowitzki, FBI agent. And yeah. So it was like times were, all of a sudden were good, yeah. And um, so do, you, do some of you guys know about this? Yeah? So uh, all of a sudden in 2010, uh, there was an, a federal investigation into uh, both Lance Armstrong and the U.S. Postal Service cycling team. And uh, so out of nowhere, Jeff Davitsky appears and um, at, he asked me to basically come in and, and speak uh, under my own steam voluntarily. As soon as I heard that, you know, because I was living by the code of the Amerta. Oh, thank you. Um, since I was still living by the code and still, you know, thought it was the best, the best, the only, the only option really was to take the secrets to the grave, I, I said no, no thank you. And uh, really before I knew it, there was a subpoena at my front doorstep, which basically means you come in, you tell the truth, you come in and you will tell the truth or you will go to jail. And that for me was like, you know, finally right in the face and it was like the, that was, that was my wake up call. Um, so I basically went into this grand jury room in July of 2010, kicking and screaming. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to go, but I knew I had to go, and I knew what I had to do, and that was tell the truth. Um, and yeah, I was not looking forward to that day. That's that's an understatement. But I went in there and told the truth and nothing but the truth, and I sat there for seven hours, and. Man, it changed my life. It changed my life. I came out of there a whole, with a whole different perspective. So I knew walking out of that courtroom, you know what? Like I wanted to scream the truth, truth from the top of my lungs. Um, so I said, I'm gonna, I need to tell the truth anyway, in any way I can. So uh, luckily for me, there was uh, 60 minutes, um, gave me the opportunity, gave me the platform to speak. And um, I told the truth in front of them. It's you know a big U.S. Uh, television show on, I, I believe on Sunday night. Um, that was the first step. And then after that, you know, that was only, unfortunately, you know, you, you only have so much time. And uh, there was a ton, a ton more information that I hadn't, wasn't able to talk about. And so I spent the next two and a half years writing a book with a guy named Dan Coyle. Um, and well, I'm not very proud of what's in the book. I'm proud of, of writing it and finally and being honest and, and telling the truth about the culture of the sport that I was in. And you know, so real quick, like I wish, I wish it weren't true, but you know, a lot of, lot, some, some people back in the States have called me a hero and that's the last thing I am, you know. I got backed up to the wall. I, I got backed up and backed up and backed up. I was at the edge of the, the cliff, you know. I was like right here off this, on this cliff and you know, I wouldn't even go in voluntarily and talk to the Jeff Nowitzki. I waited to the last possible moment. It was either jump off the cliff or tell the truth. Um, you know, finally, it, you know, like a rock to the head, I, I told the truth. I mean, it, it was, you know, it's, it's a little bit, um, yeah, and I'm not, I'm not proud of like holding out for so long, but I am proud that I finally did the right thing and told the whole truth. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I was, I thought, you know, why did I lie for so long? Yeah, I thought it was, it was like, like most people living with a lie, I thought, like, I thought that 
I mean, I, number one, was scared, and I thought it was easier and better for everybody else involved to just keep on living with a lie. Um, were there consequences of telling the truth? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, every day I'm still working on, like, gaining sort of respect back, and, you know, that's, that's been a hard uphill battle, but, you know, every day it gets a little bit better. Um, you know, I have old friends, teammates, coworkers, you know, that no longer want to speak to me. You know, I'm, you know, a sport that I love so much and will continue to love for the rest of my life. You know, at, at the top tier, you know, I'm not welcome. And, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's understandable, but it's still, it's still hard. Um, and it's, you know, I'm also, yeah, working every day to regain the trust from people, from, you know, from a lot of, uh, a lot of people I was close to. Um, So, yeah, I'll, I'll leave you just with this, and I know we've got to go soon. Um, so whether or not, whether it's about winning a bike race or getting a promotion or making money in the stock market, there's a pressure to succeed, succeed in every industry. And there are rewards, whether it's fame, money, pride, personal validation, whatever it may be. And, and in every industry, there are unwritten rules. The problem with unwritten rules is they're unwritten for a reason. They're usually wrong. And in some cases, if you don't conform, conform, like bend the rules, you will most likely never succeed or most likely never win or be at the very top. You know, are you prepared for that? You know, are you prepared to walk away? You know, unfortunately, I wasn't prepared for that question in 1997. I, sh I wish I'd thought about it more. And, you know, after I wasn't prepared to basically let my dream go after about a thousand days of pushing myself to the limit. Um, but if I knew at that moment in my life what my life would be like, what would, what would be expected of me, what the toll would be, you know, I would have been on that first flight back to Boston. So when you're, when you're confronted with choices, the unwritten rules, the lure of, su of success, the rationalization that it's okay because everybody is doing it, uh, the feeling of acceptance and being let in on an exclusive inner circle. You have to take a step back, or take two steps back, or take three steps back. Take a few deep breaths and understand that there is a price to pay, even if you don't get caught. There's guilt, there's paranoia, you know, there's never being at peace, you know, there's never being at peace with yourself, being able to look in the mirror. Um, but lies will almost always catch up with you. And when they do, will you be able to accept your choices, your actions, your performances, your deeds, your life? So I don't know who I would have been in 20 years time, you know, really, if living at all. But I do know uh, if I kept, kept living with this incredible burden of lies, but I do know who I am today, and that's happy, fulfilled, grateful, and free, so. Thank you. Thank you.